Nowadays, religion seems to exist purely to ensure that the human race doesn't go too long without having unnecessary wars. However, if we were to take a trip back in time to ancient Greece, we would discover that most of the worship deities from that era served somewhat different purposes. Humans are an inquisitive bunch, and lacking the side of acknowledge that we possess today, the ancient Greeks attributed many inexplicable phenomena to the actions of their gods, demigods, the personifications of observable effects. Obviously, there's a much more interesting take on religion, spawned some crazy stories, most of which have exactly the same amount of supporting evidence as the stories from modern day religion. In today's episode, we're going to take a close look at some of those stories. Although when most people think about Greek mythology, they have Zeus at the top of the godly pyramid, that was not always the case. The story of Zeus's rise to power is an interesting and a brutal one, as you're about to discover. So what happens? Well, before Zeus, the top job was held by a dude called Kronos. Unfortunately for his children, Kronos had received a prophecy which claimed that one day he would be overthrown by his son. Given that Kronos himself had taken his position from his father, he was perhaps understandably just a little bit anxious for history to not repeat itself. Therefore, as soon as his wife Rhea, who was also his sister because Greek mythology, when she gave birth to each of their children, Demeter, Hades, Hera, Hestia, Poseidon, and Zeus, Kronos snatched them from her and swallowed them whole. Again, Greek mythology, everybody. Or at least, that was what he thought happened. As it transpired, Rhea wasn't all that keen on having her offspring swallowed, and so she hatched a plan. When her next child, Zeus, was born, she squirreled him away somewhere and provided Kronos with a large rock wrapped in infant clothing. He he swallowed the whole bundle before going about the business of the day. What happened next is the subject of some debate. Presumably due to the fact that babies make a lot of noise and Rhea did not think Kronos would believe that she had found the first ever crying rock, baby Zeus was quickly transported to the island of Crete, where depending on the version of the story, he was raised to adolescence by either Gaia, Mother Earth, or a nymph called Amathea, who may or may not have been a goat. Upon hearing of the unfortunate fate of his siblings, the now teenage Zeus decided that his father was no longer fit to rule. After tricking him into drinking some sort of vomiting potion, which caused him to regurgitate the swallowed babies, who happily continued their development inside their father's digestive tract, Zeus, as Kronos had done to his father, removed the top god's testicles with a scythe. <laughs> it's wild, dude. <laughs> The battle that followed was both long and bloody, but eventually Zeus and his siblings emerged victorious. Once the spoils of war had been shared out, Zeus became the supreme leader of both the earth and the sky. Poseidon was given dominion over the oceans, and Hades was put in charge of the underworld. And that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, is how Zeus became king of the gods. It was king weird, dude. Let's talk about something we all hate, being tracked online. You're just trying to look up cute cat videos, and BOOM! You're bombarded with ads for, I don't know, litter boxes or a fancy vacuum or something. It's creepy, but there is a way to make it stop. And that's where Surfshark comes in. It is keeping you safe online. It protects your data. It keeps nosy companies and even hackers from knowing your every move. Surfshark steps in, encrypts your data and blocks those annoying ads and malware. And here's the best part. Surfshark doesn't just cover one device. It can secure unlimited devices with one account. So the whole family's Netflix binge totally safe. And speaking of Netflix, ever get bummed when your favorite show is blocked in your country and one day it's available and the next thing it's gone is only available in Japan or something? Well, just switch to one of Surfshark's 3,200 plus servers across 100 locations and you'll be watching again in no time. If you want to surf the web safely and unlock a world of content, give Surfshark a try. And don't forget, there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. So there's literally no risk. Just hit the link in the description below to start your journey to a safer, more private internet. And enter the code side projects for four extra months for free at surfshock.com slash side projects. Thanks to them for sponsoring and now back to today's episode. As we mentioned in the introduction, many stories from Greek mythology arose to explain various natural phenomena. The story of Echo is one such example as the story goes, even after Zeus secured his place as the god of gods and finally settled down with his seventh wife, Hera, who also happened to be sister. Of course she did. He was still, shall we say, less than a paragon of monogamy. Nobody else in the entire history of fiction or reality could quite compare to Zeus when it comes to the lengths he went to in the pursuit of infidelity. Quite reasonably, Hera wasn't exactly pleased with her husband constantly neglecting his duties while in pursuit of the next pretty young thing, and she would go to extraordinary lengths to exact retribution. Sadly, after one spectacularly failed attempt to overthrow her husband, the target of her retribution became the ladies of her husband's desire 
desire. This was a most unreasonable course of action, not least because many of these ladies were less than willing participants. So what did she do to Echo? Well, during one of his many, many trips away from Mount Olympus, Zeus was enjoying the company of yet another nymph when he became aware of his angry wife fast approaching. In order to make his escape, Zeus convinced Echo, a different nymph, to intercept and delay Hera as best she could. Not wanting to displease the most powerful being in the known universe, Echo did just that. In truth, she was perfectly suited to the task. Described as outgoing, chatty, a master of flattery, and generally pleasant to be around, Echo initially had no problems slowing down the progress of the angry wife. After intercepting her, Echo spoke at length about how awesome Hera was, how she had always longed to meet her, and generally blew some more sunshine up her backside. So, with gods being a generally rather prideful bunch, Hera was more than happy to listen to all of this. That is, until she realized that she was being deceived and that she would no longer be able to catch her husband in the act, as it were. To punish Echo for using her conversational talents for evil, Hera removed her ability to speak entirely. Well, almost entirely. From that day forth, Echo would only be able to repeat the words spoken to her by others. Filled, ah, oh, clever with the name, Echo. Filled with embarrassment and shame, she fled into the wilderness to live a life of solitude. Unfortunately for Echo, that was not the end of her troubles. Several years into her self-imposed exile, Echo had the misfortune of spotting a particularly attractive young man by the name of Narcissus and instantly fell in love with him. After following him through the woods for a while, she approached and attempted to introduce herself. However, it's quite hard to chat somebody up when you realize you can only repeat the last thing that they say. Said. After a brief exchange, Narcissus dismissed her in no uncertain terms. Realizing that she was destined to spend eternity alone, Echo once again fled into the wilderness, where, consumed by her own grief, she slowly faded away until nothing but her voice remained. Almost every religion has at least one cautionary tale about what happens if you disrespect those on high, and the religion of the ancient Greeks is no exception. So, what's the story here? Well, once upon a time, there lived a man called Erisichthon. Just exactly who he was is a matter of some debate. Some versions of the story describe him as the king of Thessaly, while others simply refer to him as an incredibly wealthy man. The one thing everyone seems to agree on is that he was quite the partier, obsessed with lavish banquets and the like. Unfortunately, he simply did not have enough party party space in his gargantuan house, so he set about looking for somewhere nearby to build a dedicated banquet hall. Fortuitously, there was a large grove nearby that contained almost every type of tree imaginable. If you were to cut down all of these trees, you would not only have the perfect amount of space, but also all of the building materials you could possibly need. As the story goes, many of the locals advised him against this. You see, the grove in question was allegedly sacred to the goddess Demeter, so leaving it well alone would probably be the best course of action. Erisithon wasn't having any of that, though. What did he care as the crazy locals thought the trees were sacred? So he and his men set out about leveling the entire grove. As the last mighty oak in the center fell beneath the blade of their axes, killing the dryad, that's a sort of tree nymph that lived inside, the rest of the dryads quickly reported the crime to Demeter, and as predicted, she was less than impressed. As punishment for this outrageous light against her, she cursed him to be eternally hungry. Initially, this didn't seem like much of a punishment. He loved feasting and was incredibly wealthy, so what could be the problem? Cardiovascular disease! Erisithon quickly he found, however, that even if he ate around the clock, he could not suppress the constant agony of starvation. His wealth began to run out too. Consuming the same amount of food as a thousand men every day was expensive. Once all of his money was gone, he was forced to sell his property, his possessions, and even his daughter to buy food. Once everything was sold, he was reduced to begging on the streets before being forced to rip off and consume his own flesh. An action which, as you can imagine, resulted in his death. Oh, with the story firmly seated in Greek mythology, you can imagine that some people would think twice about desecrating things that were allegedly sacred. Sacred. Everyone who's old enough to be watching this video should have a pretty good idea of how they came into the world. Granted, you might not know exactly who is responsible for creating you, but unless we are missing some fundamental information about childbirth, you were either born naturally or via cesarean section. Fortunately, for the interests of storytelling at least, the various gods of Greek mythology did not limit themselves to such mundane methods of childbirth as we're about to see. Believe it or not, this story also involves Zeus not being able to control himself and his wife finding out about it. Classic Zeus. As the story goes, the king of the gods, while looking down from Mount Olympus one day, spotted a mortal princess named Semele and decided that she must be his. Once again, classic Zeus. Most unusually for Zeus, this particular courtship did not involve much in the way of actual trickery. He simply adopted a human form, went down to earth, introduced himself, and declared his interest in, shall we say, certain activities. After the two, 
had engaged in those certain activities, Semele became pregnant with Zeus's child. Sadly for her, it was around this time that Hera found out what was going on, and so, well, her days were numbered, weren't they? Disguising herself as an old lady, Hera made her way down to Earth and struck up a conversation with the young princess. During this conversation, Semele mentioned to the old lady that she was pregnant, and after some persistent coaxing, she admitted that the father of the baby was none other than the king of the gods. Although she knew this was absolutely true, Hera feigned disbelief, asking how she could possibly know that the father was indeed Zeus and not just some random chancer. She went on to say that the only way she could confirm whether or not this was true was to ask him on his next visit to promise on his honor that he would grant her a wish, and once he did this, to insist that he reveal to her his true form. Then and only then could she be sure that the father of her child was indeed the almighty Zeus. The next time Zeus put in an appearance, probably not off to pay child support, mind you, Semele did exactly as she had been advised. Initially, Zeus was more than happy to grant her a wish, only becoming reluctant when he found out what the wish was. However, having sworn on his honor, he had little choice, and so he reluctantly revealed his true form. On the plus side, this did indeed prove him to be Zeus. What was slightly less positive was that Zeus's true form was essentially a raging thundercloud filled with lightning, and she was killed instantly. Determined to save his unborn child, Zeus reached into the remains of his lover, extracted the miraculously still alive fetus, and stuffed it into a freshly cut hole in his leg. What the f is going on. Some months later, when the baby had fully developed, Dionysus, the god of wine and good times, was born. Naturally. While this is undoubtedly a traumatic birth story, it did at least give Dionysus a killer icebreaker at any party. And he went to many parties. According to the ancient Greeks, there was a time when the weather was always pleasant. Crops grew year-round, everyone always had a splendid suntan, and harsh winters had not yet been invented. This idyllic way of life would have continued if it were not for the actions of Hades. Hades, as you may remember from earlier in the video, was the brother of Zeus and was in charge of the underworld. As it happened, he had at least one thing in common with his brother, a complete inability to understand that no really does mean no. You see, Hades had a thing for Persephone, daughter of Demeter, who as we mentioned earlier, was the goddess of agriculture. One day, while Persephone was out picking flowers, Hades abducted her and dragged her down to the underworld. Quite naturally, Demeter was beside herself with grief and, as a result, largely neglected her agricultural duties, resulting in widespread famine throughout the world. When Zeus became aware that his brother's actions were causing all of his devoted worshippers to starve, he intervened and insisted that Persephone be returned to the world. Unfortunately, before he let her go, Hades convinced the young girl to eat a single pomegranate seed, and for some reason, that never seems to be fully explained in mythology, this meant that she could never truly leave the underworld. This, as you might imagine, caused something of a problem. Eventually, however, it was agreed that Persephone would spend four months of every year with Hades before returning to spend the rest of the year with her mother. This is how it has been to this day. For the eight months of the year that Demeter has her daughter by her side, things grow, the weather is nice, and everything is generally fairly glorious. However, when Persephone must return to Hades, Demeter once again becomes depressed, and both the weather and agricultural production suffer as a result. A perfect plausible explanation for anyone who doesn't understand how seasons actually work. While it's easy to pour scorn and ridicule on these ancient beliefs, patting ourselves on the back because of how far we've come and how foolish and idiotic people in the past were, idiots, it is worth reiterating the point we made at the beginning of this video. All of the stories that we have covered today have exactly the same amount of supporting evidence as almost every story contained within the Bible, the Quran, and every other modern day religious text. The only difference being that in our opinion, these stories are a lot more insane. Thank you.